Well, hi everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present today at your conference. It's a real honor to be speaking to some of my Canadian friends, especially those in the Vancouver area. So thanks again for the opportunity. I'm really excited to present on behalf of the Greenhouse Project and the title we've put together is really caring for those we hold dear and really thinking about that whole premise that we wanna honor our elders and really take a look at what have we learned over the years since the Greenhouse Project's inception and what have we especially learned during the COVID crisis? So I'm going to start today with a question for all of you, and I hope it will be a question that will engage your participation. When I think about design for senior living, when I think about design for long-term care, it really occurs to me that our shared humanity would have us ask the question, well, what would you need? If you wanted to live life on your own terms, what would you need in order to do that? So I'm going to invite you, I'm just going to take a minute or less, um, but to have you write your responses in the chat box. Think about if you woke up tomorrow and you needed long-term care, you needed nursing home level of care, what would you need in order to live life on your own terms? So if you wanna find the chat box, you can just put your responses in the chat box and I'll just wait a little bit of time for you to respond. I think if you're like most people, uh, most people are going to say, I want my dignity, I want my privacy. I wanna be able to get up when I want. I wanna go to sleep when I want. I wanna eat what I want. So maybe those are some of the things that you have put in the chat box. Or if you didn't find the chat box, just write it down on a piece of paper. But I want you to think about what you need and what you see in the greenhouse model. Because I think what's important is that it's not what they need, as if they're different. Their needs are different from our very own needs. Obviously, good quality care is a given but it really goes beyond that. And I'm going to describe a model for you that I think is really that more comprehensive approach and really addresses some of the fundamental things that are important to each of us. So I'm a nurse and I can tell you that when I saw the greenhouse model, oh gosh, it was in 2005. So now we, it's been quite a while, 16 years since I saw the greenhouse model. And I, when I saw it, it was my home care world and long-term world coming together. But what I did notice is that it was a radical paradigm shift, that everything that I had known as a former director of nursing uh, from an institutional traditional perspective, it was a paradigm shift. The other thing is that it was a comprehensive change. In other words, it wasn't just the physical environment as incredible as it was that had changed, but it really was the philosophical culture as well as the organizational redesign and what had happened in the workforce model that really made it a comprehensive approach. And last but not least, the intention to sustain change, that it wasn't enough just to implement change, but it was really an intention about sustaining it. So I'm going to show you, I think the most boring slide that we have, but it's to illustrate a point. These are our core values. What I described as physical environment, philosophical culture and organizational redesign or workforce is really framed in three core values. That defines greenhouse. It's real home, meaningful life, and empowered staff. So let's break it down a bit. Real home. Well, a real home size matters. A real home does not have double loaded corridors where you've got two, three, four people in a room. Size matters. What you're looking at is a greenhouse home in Longmont, Colorado. And they have 12 private rooms and baths for the elders that live in that home. So let's take a look private rooms. When you think about real home, to have that sense of autonomy, that space that's uniquely yours. You don't have to share it with anybody. You're not arguing who gets the bed by the window, but 
you have the window and you have that space. In addition, you've got access to a three-piece uh, three bath. You can see the roll-in uh, shower there. You've got the, the commode, the sink, and so forth. So when you think about your bathing needs, you've got the privacy, and it's right there in the warmth and comfort of your own room. I think real home means that you've got access to food 24-7. So in a greenhouse home, we have decentralized the dietary department, dining services, so that each greenhouse home has its own kitchen and meals are prepared when you want what you want. And you've got access to nutrition, hydration, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's a unique concept. That's real home. I think for me, one of my most favorite pieces about a greenhouse home is the easy access to outside. I don't like to be shut inside. When it's a nice day, just get me outside. Let me feel the sun on my face. I remember a time I was visiting a, a nursing home in Alaska. And I was talking to one of the residents in the nursing home. And I'll never forget, I said, it's a beautiful day. Let's go outside. And his response to me, he said, go outside. I haven't been outside since I moved in five years ago. And so we went outside. And I can tell you, in Alaska, we had some of the most beautiful vistas to take in and really enjoy with all of our senses. And in fact, that's what we did. But the reality is he didn't have the access. He didn't have somebody to take him. And so for five years, he had been deprived of being able to experience the joy and not to mention some of the other health benefits that he might have had um, had he been able to go outside. So this is the courtyard of St. John's Home in Rochester, New York. They have two greenhouse homes and these two homes are actually embedded in a real community. And the homes, the backyards kind of have, you can see the gazebo in the, the middle. Think of the opportunities. Think of the normalcy that the elders living in those homes are able to achieve by being able to go outside. If you kind of peek there to the, the left of the screen, you'll see a raised garden bed. I have been there so many times in the summer. And let me tell you, their gardens grow well. And the joy that the elders and even family members and you know the kids and so forth are there really helping to um, achieve the, the best growth for their gardens. It was really interesting. There was a gentleman there who loved to get his hands in, in the dirt there and grow things. And what was really interesting because they were these homes were embedded in a regular neighborhood, not a senior living community he was able to actually tap into some of the insights and wisdoms from his neighbors in the real neighborhood to really help him kind of experience how can I produce the best growth. And so they would share kind of their stories. Oftentimes they would uh, share some really communal community events in that courtyard with their extended neighborhood. That's real home. It's what you or I might do. So let's go to the next core value, meaningful life. I say to have a meaningful life, it's all about relationships. This happens to be a picture taken during COVID and it was a husband and wife celebrating their anniversary during COVID time. And I love this to think about, once again, that sense of normalcy and that philosophical shift or the culture that really defines what it's like to be in a greenhouse home. And the, the workforce, they were able to arrange this private dining experience for this couple to be able to really experience the celebration that was deeply meaningful to them. And you can see the flowers, you can see the balloon, the cake, the, the in this case, non-alcoholic champagne to really uh, tap off their celebration but how important it is when you think about the philosophical culture that is filling the real home. So once again, let's uh, take a look. What does it mean? Deep knowing relationships. Relationships are at the core of a philosophical culture that is really valuing what I would say in the next slide, relationship-rich, person-directed living. So let's think 
for a moment. We all like to talk about person-centered care. And typically when we do surveys and say, who's doing it? Everybody's saying we're doing it. But Greenhouse has gone a bit further. And they've gone a bit further in really creating intention about what does it mean? First of all, I would say that it's not just care that is centered upon a person. Think about the difference between person-centered care and person-directed living. Person-centered, person-directed. Directed. Who's in the driver's seat? Where is that sense of autonomy and control best seen? I would argue it's in the person directed. You know, if it's centered on me, I it, people know who I am, but when I'm directing it, I'm in the driver's seat and I feel that sense of control and autonomy to not just direct my care, but in the case of this, it's to direct my living, my daily life, to really unpack and uncover what is meaningful and purposeful living. It's, it's not just doing meaningless activities where we get everybody together, but understanding the individual and intrinsic worth of each person that is in, living in a greenhouse home. So the reality is it's all about leadership in order to get us where we want to go. And so that leads us into empowered staff. And I would say empowered staff, it's a function of leadership. Leaders typically, when you think about a typical organizational um, chart, where does power sit? Who's making all the decisions? It's typically very top-down, hierarchical. The administrator, the CEO, they're in charge of all the resources. They're in charge typically of making all the decisions. So when I say it's all about leadership, it's all about leaders that are willing and able to share power and to share decision-making so that we really have flattened the hierarchy and we're really trying to ensure that everyone has a voice, including the elder and those working closest to them. So greenhouse, one word, Anybody ever had a greenhouse? What is a greenhouse that grows plants? A greenhouse that grows plants is really trying to create the optimal environment that produces the best growth or optimal growth in plants. And you can see the greenhouse, one word, that's growing plants on the left side of your screen. Greenhouse, two words, is about growing people. The green is growth. Yes, we love LEED certified and, and building sustainable homes, but at the end of the day, greenhouse is really, the green is focused on growth and really, really trying to produce growth in people. The elders that live there, as well as the staff that are working there. In order for an elder to be able to have a meaningful and purposeful life, it's important that the staff that support them are empowered to enable them to do that. And so how does that happen? It really is all about consistent staffing. I remember as a director of nursing, it always seemed prudent when somebody called in, what did we typically do? We were floating staff here and there. What happens when you've got floaters, you've got staff that is floating from one unit to the other, and this is not COVID time that I'm, I'm speaking, but what happens when you are floating staff and you don't have that consistency? How much harder is it to really establish those deep knowing relationships? And the previous uh, a couple of slides back when I was talking about honoring a person's rhythm, if you don't have consistency in staffing, it's going to be much harder for your um, your staff to be able to understand who that person is and really to honor the deep knowing relationships and to really be able to support them. I love the, the picture. Both pictures say so much, but uh, I think the one on the left, you can see the elder there really fully appreciating and having quite the relationship to be able to acknowledge the staff that is uh, obviously expecting and just kind of 
watching the growth, watching perhaps even the movement of the baby, but to really have that deep knowing relationship. This is not a new staff member coming in that day. This is somebody where there's a relationship. The story on, on the right, I think is one of my favorite. This one on the right actually was during COVID time. The gentleman was a farmer. This is a, a, a greenhouse home in the state of Arkansas. And what was really incredible is, you know, the you could kind of feel the tension with COVID brewing and really, you know, the staff really wanting to do all that they could to mitigate the spread of the infection. Well, this particular guy was a little restless, living with some cognitive impairment. And so you can see the staff members said, ah, guess what they're doing in the back? We're gonna walk out back and we're gonna watch the farmer plow his field. What that did to this particular gentleman who had been a farmer, just to be able to go out and watch it. And with somebody who had been, who's a deep knowing relationship with them, she knew this would be meaningful to him. She knew that it would spark conversation and that it would really generate some, some lasting memories and moments for them. And certainly was a way for him to just get the fresh air, the sunshine and everything that would be important to optimizing his health. That's growth, it's meaning, it's purposeful living and it's the power of consistent staffing. I love this picture. In a greenhouse home, we really are doing some cost shifting. So where you might've had dietary aids, housekeeping aids, laundry aids, because we've decentralized those departments, uh, laundry, dietary, and housekeeping. So everything is contained within the home. That's where you're gonna do the laundry. It's where you'll do the housekeeping. You'll have all your supplies there. It's where you're gonna do the cooking. And so versatile workers, we've organized ourselves. Those dietary aids kind of at time uh, shifts into, we call them certified nursing assistants in the States. So your, your CNA time um, will rise and your laundry dietary aids, that goes down and gets absorbed. It's shifted here. So you've got ample staffing. Um, our staffing ratios for a home of 12 people you would, uh, 12 residents, you would have three people that are supporting those elders on day shift. You'll have two people on evenings and one to 12 at night. And they are trained. A versatile worker is somebody that's going to do not just the care, but they'll do the cooking. They will do the cleaning. They will do the laundry. And in this case, I love it. Somebody even is doing the caulking. Obviously, with the mask, you can see that this is during COVID time. But just imagine having access to nutrition, to hydration, being able to prepare your food, to have fewer people coming and going in the house, to be able to have everything that you need to be successful. That's an empowered workforce, and that translates to better outcomes. So empowerment doesn't happen. You know, I, I said it was... Um, it's inextricably linked to leadership, wise leaders that are willing to provide the necessary support to share decision-making uh, with the self-managed work team, the versatile worker. But in addition to that, what does education look like? And in order to get empowerment, it's important that you create intention about really making sure that your team is equipped Part of a leader's responsibility is making sure that team is equipped with the knowledge that they need to be successful. And that happens through education. You can see kind of an outline of some of the education and training that the Greenhouse Project does. Um, we start with the CNA again in um, the States. That's that designation, that certified designation for a certified nursing assistant that works in nursing home. That's where we start. But in addition to that, we want to bring additional hours. And those hours, we really focus, well, let's take, if you're going to ask the CNA to be a cook, what might they need? 40 hours of culinary training. And that is safe food handling. Um, it is the basics and beyond. You know, we did a survey at one time and we discovered only 10% of those that were working 
um, or, or coming to work in a greenhouse home had prior experience of cooking. And so if that's the case, that means 90% did not have a culinary skill set so important if we're asking them to cook that we really need to think about what is our culinary training program going to be? We'll start with basics. Um, we're going to get the safe food handling. Um, in the States, we have a serve safe certificate and each state does it a little bit different. Um, so we need to make sure what is the state requirement to make sure they have passed the test and that we meet those requirements. But then the rest of the 40 hours, we really need to know the culture of the organization. We need to understand the skill set of the team, what the mechanism by which to order their food and, and so forth will be and customize a culinary training program for them. I remember um, we have several uh, Jewish organizations and as they were creating kosher kitchens, think about then how you would alter your culinary training to really accommodate uh, kosher food, kosher cooking and kosher kitchens. And so the culinary um, program, the, that 40 hours is really, it's important to make sure that we customize it well. Another 40 hours is really getting to know the house. For example, think about the dishwasher that's in your own home. Think about a dishwasher that needs to meet um, some of the temperature requirements. It's a, a smaller cycle. So we typically have commercial grade dishwashers that look very residential, but they function differently than uh, what a residential model would that somebody might be accustomed to. So it's getting to know that. It's getting to know your budget. It's getting to understand the ceiling lifts that are in each of those bedrooms that would transfer someone from the bed to the toilet or into the shower. So it's just getting to know the, the house, the room, uh, the, the policies, the procedures that will really help to define what they do. In addition, home maintenance. As you saw the person caulking, you realize that, you know, how far will you equip your team? What's their baseline knowledge and where do you need to go? So it's really creating a very customized um, cultural path for your workers to really make sure that they're supported, well-resourced and equipped to be successful. And then it's 40 hours of greenhouse training. And that's where we really, we get into our dementia best life approach. We have a, a very beautiful and unique approach with um, our best life approach to memory care. In addition to that, we want communication and critical thinking. What does it look like in this model? If we've empowered our direct care staff, um, what does it look like? How are they in relationship with the nurse? and other clinical support team members. What does it look like from a communication, critical thinking and teamwork perspective? And last but not least is how do we develop policies and procedures? You know, you can't take the same structure, the same policies and procedures and expect people to show up and do things differently. So what do we need to do to reshape, reframe, redo our policies and procedures to more fully embrace those core values that we talk about within the greenhouse uh, structure. Many times I have asked this question to greenhouse partners across the country. And this was a conversation I had with my good friend, Rebecca Priest, who was the, at the time, the chief operating officer at St. John's Home in Rochester, New York. And I said, so you're achieving amazing outcomes. What's the secret? for success. And the first thing she said was, you can't half jump, that you've got to fully commit, you've got to go the distance. And then she said, and then you just live the values. So let's break them down. What about those values really contribute to achieving the success that we all would want? Meaningful life, I said it's all about relationships. When you are in deep knowing relationships, and I can tell you as a nurse, I have learned this over time, that early detection, when you pick up on something much more quickly, you are going to, that early detection translates to better outcomes. I can intervene much more quickly when there is early detection. So relationships, not just between the care partner with the elder, 
but the care team, what are those relationships like? And what are the communication structures and mechanisms by which we're talking? But we know relationship-based care will bring better quality of life and quality care experiences to elders. Empowered staff, you know, I always say that empowered staff, it's like, okay, yes, we're gonna empower the staff. It's not that simple. It's really about creating conditions for empowerment. And it really is, it's all about leadership and really, again, leaders that are willing to share decision-making, willing to share power, willing to equip the, the team with everything they need to be successful and holding them accountable. So you'll see one of the, the bullets there at the end is balancing support and accountability. It's not just throwing all the support there without holding accountable. Of course, that's part of it. And it's a balance. And each one of us has a tendency to fall kind of, it's rare that we're, we're good at balancing support and accountability, but understanding who we are as leaders and what we might need to do to really achieve that balance that we're seeking so that we have that coaching collaborative culture. A fully empowered self-managed work team will yield a high performing team. And once again, just to have you take a look at those bullets uh, right there. It really is about disseminating the information and really understanding, as I said in an earlier slide with education, that how will we share information I talked about the self-managed work team and I just wanna spend a moment talking about the coordinator roles. So it's not just enough to say that uh, we're going to be in a self-managed work team, but it really is trying to unpack what does it mean? How do we organize ourselves? And so in the greenhouse model, there are five coordinator roles within that self-managed work team. The first is the care coordinator that obviously care is critically important. So we're going to have one of those workers uh, be the care coordinator. And that care coordinator will make sure that, you know, our care plan meetings, that we've got the right people scheduled, that families are involved, the person, the elder is involved, and we've got the right members of the team to really come to the table to really um, have meaningful care conferences. And then the information from that goes out and really gets implemented. Care coordinator, a team coordinator, a team coordinator, you know, if we are talking about teams, we need to create intention about how often is the team meeting and what's on the agenda of those meetings so that we really make sure our teams are addressing the issues, the challenges, the problems that come up. I can only imagine during COVID how many times these teams might have had to get their heads together to really kind of unpack what was happening and what they needed to do to address some of those issues care coordinator, team coordinator, scheduling coordinator. In the greenhouse model, they are doing self-scheduling. An empowered role means that they've got some power over their schedules and they work as a team to be able to self-schedule. So there is a coordinator that is designated to be the person who is really getting schedules together and working again as a team to ensure they've got all of those, uh, those shifts covered. Um, you've got a housekeeping coordinator. Housekeeping coordinator, you know, we've got to create intention to make sure each room is clean, that the deep cleaning is done when it needs to be done. And we kind of figure out on a 24 seven, it doesn't mean that person is doing all the cleaning, but making sure that there is kind of a schedule and that we're all, the accountability metrics are there to make sure that we're getting it done. And last but not least, certainly, is food coordinator and really making sure that elders' wishes are made known, that they really have what they need and uh, all the food supplies, that they're staying within their budget, and that elder wishes are reflected in the menu and they've got what they need. So coordinator roles and really making sure that if I'm the scheduling coordinator, I know what that means. And I know what the systems or structures are to ensure that I get it done. How do you achieve success? What's the secret? 
it's living those values. It's not just focusing on the physical environment or one value, but it's the comprehensiveness of each one. And last but not least is, is real home. I referenced um, normalcy earlier. And so I have here the power of normal. There is nothing that really feels normal in a traditional institution. Nursing homes were modeled after hospitals. There's nothing that feels normal or real home when you're in a hospital. Um, and I can tell you, you know, any visits that I have made to loved ones in a hospital, there is nothing normal or nothing felt like real home to me at all. So when we normalize our environments, when we really normalize our programs even, there's a power of normal that really translates to how a person feels, how a person sees him or herself. And it really translates to how a person then will behave or show up. And so when we think about the best life approach, the power of normal is actually one of those, uh, the principles within the best life approach. And it really is making sure that a person really has the opportunity to be in a real home and to experience that sense of normalcy and the power of normal in age appropriate activities and all the interactions that that person would have. So three core values, achieving success is living the values. Greenhouse advantage, and we've got research that will kind of tell you, so why greenhouse? What, what difference does it make? I'll just build a small house. Well, the advantage is that we really do have, we've assembled um, a community of thought leaders, I call them, linked up is one of our, it's our membership um, network that we have among greenhouse um, partners that are out there. The other thing is, given the fact that we do have this network, we've been able to research, do some research. And so these are all research studies that have been done um, that are out there. We did one in 2012 and really surveyed 1,000 informal caregivers that had, were caring for their loved one in their own homes. And these were the things that consumers said that they really appreciated about the model. It was really all about the private rooms and the full private bathrooms. It was all about the flexible schedules and the really truly resident focused, resident centered care. And they loved the real home, the small size just really resonated with these, um, these caregivers, informal caregivers. Resident and family satisfaction. This was uh, research that was done about in, Actually, this was uh, one of the first studies that was done in the, the greenhouse homes in Tupelo, Mississippi, when they first opened. Uh, the late Dr. Rosalie Kane did this study and really found that, that resident and family satisfaction improved quality of life for the residents and families were really all over it. Engagement and quality of care. This was a, a study done by Dr. Barbara Bowers and, and several colleagues. And really, um, they did an analysis actually of the amount of time I think the, the thinking was if we are spending all this time in all these various roles, so you're not just doing care, but you're doing all these other things, we're concerned that they'll be so busy doing these things that there'll be less resident engagement. And in fact, they found that just the opposite uh, was the case. More direct care time, increased engagement with elders and better care outcomes. And at the end of my slides, I do have contact information if you'd like the research. Uh, studies that were done on this. All right, so I've talked about some really wonderful things, but let's talk about what has happened in nursing homes the last year. And I think 2020 was a year we will never forget. It was certainly one of those life-defining experiences, um, hopefully a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So let's look at COVID-19 and greenhouse homes. I think as we were looking probably uh, little more than a year ago, we were recognizing as the data was starting to come out that nursing homes were having the highest number of COVID-19 cases and certainly the highest mortality rates. And there were horrific stories that were emerging from when the Kirkland, Washington thing happened. And then we had certainly outbreaks in New York and along the, the Northeast corridor of the US. And so 
you know, some of the things that as they were looking at it, they said, well, it's very obvious. You've got some resident risk factors and organizational risk factors. Um, residents living in nursing homes, there's a lot of comorbidities. We, you know, they are a frailer population so that they're more likely to have with those risk factors more likely to be susceptible to COVID. The organization, we've talked a lot about it already, that institutional double loaded corridors, the size, um, those are risk factors when you're thinking about mitigating the spread of infection. Research was starting to be published that said smaller nursing homes seems to be reducing some of those risk factors. So it was actually in April of 2020 that Dr. Cheryl Zimmerman from the University of North Carolina reached out to me and she said, I think that we should do some research here. And so we started looking at the greenhouse homes. Here's our data that we collected. This is the raw data that we took a look at. And we looked at data that was really compiling it from January through the end of May was the first swath of data, and then monthly through the end of the year. You can see on the left in traditional nursing homes, this is uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services reported data. Per 1,000 nursing home residents, we had 445. Uh, in greenhouse homes, less than half of that for COVID cases. On the right side, you see mortality rates. And in the, um, the COVID deaths, you can see here on the greenhouse side, far, far less, 86.8 in the traditional CMS and 25 in greenhouse homes. Compelling for sure. So let's take a monthly snapshot looking January through May once again, and looking through the end of March. And you can, I think what was interesting, we were so excited to, to just kind of see where things were going as the surges were happening. Would Greenhouse stand the test of time? And you can see where there were surges in, in CMS data, you could also see in Greenhouse data. There were surges there too, but always 100% of the time, less in greenhouse homes uh, when compared to their traditional counterparts. Here you go, here's the, the deaths and um, even more significant in greenhouse homes. Gray is the traditional and green is obviously greenhouse. So working with Dr. Zimmerman, what I showed you in the last three slides were just raw data. This was quantity wise and you know, kind of what we were experiencing. We started learning that uh, location, location, location was really important. That where there was community spread, you were going to see the commensurate spread in nursing homes. And also that the size of the facility seemed to matter. So with Dr. Zimmerman, we engaged in a study that said, we're gonna look at data from January 1 through the end of July. And we were going to really take the greenhouse home data in a particular location, and we were going to compare it with nursing homes in the same geographic region, looking at nursing home sizes of less than 50 beds and greater than 50 beds. So just a couple slides to kind of show you. I, I think this is just striking uh, to me. So we're looking at the 75th percentile. And per 100 residents that were followed, um, looking at traditional less than 50 beds, less than 50 beds had twice the rate of cases as that of the greenhouse homes. But those larger facilities, greater than 50 beds, they had nine times the rate that a greenhouse home would have. In addition to that, look at the mortality rate. And this is, I think, a, a rather interesting slide to me. So looking at greenhouse homes, kind of those per 100 positive cases, how many of those cases resulted in death? In greenhouse, it was less than 0.01%. But in the traditional, uh, less than 50 beds, we saw 50 of those 100 positive cases result in death. In a traditional greater than 50, we saw 30 per 100 positive cases. So in some ways it felt a little bit counterintuitive to us as we looked at that. And believe me, these researchers uh, really 
drilled down to make sure they had this right. The, the hypothesis here is that the Smaller nursing homes, less than 50 uh, beds, perhaps did not have some of the infrastructure or systems that the larger facilities had to be able to address those positive cases. And so you can see we're in a smaller, um, you might have expected uh, less death. Um, actually, it was um, you know, more than that. So interesting uh, data to be sure. So what did we learn? That non-traditional small house nursing homes like the greenhouse model, and it really was our data that was studied, that COVID cases may be fewer. And again, they're making um, this attributable to the private bedrooms and bathrooms, the limited ancillary staff, and that's where that versatile worker, the fewer interactions, fewer people coming and going in the house and the smaller household size really had a lot to do with mitigating the spread of the COVID infection. And in addition to that, I think you've got to think about the psychosocial factors. I can't tell you all the times that people in greenhouse, elders in greenhouse homes were outside gardening in those raised garden beds, or they were outside just sitting in the sun. When I think about vitamin D, building our immune systems and that access to the fresh air, um, I think that had to be, had something to do with our well-being. So mortality may be less because of those psychosocial factors. And once again, um, there is speculation, did those greenhouse homes, the residents there, they did not adjust for resident risk factors. And there was speculation, might they have had fewer risk factors? Anecdotally, we know not. And from previous research, we know that's not the case, that the residents in greenhouse would be very comparable to a resident in a traditional home. These were skilled nursing residents, not assisted living, just to be clear. Um, the other speculation was that non-traditional homes like greenhouse, um, they are, and we do know this, that they are more not-for-profit. Um, and we have done some wage studies um, and they may pay higher wages. So thoughts to consider, but certainly I can tell you by designing small, you get big results. And I think the media explosion that has occurred with greenhouse homes is evidence that it has really gained the attention uh, really internationally. I just read a, an article that was in a, a, a paper in Madrid, uh, Spain, that was really touting the virtues of the greenhouse model. And what I'm showing you here are all greenhouse homes. And we'll start at the top left. That's a Jewish senior life. And you'll see three greenhouse homes represented there. Um, there's a greenhouse home on each level. So you would access obviously the, the top home via an elevator. And you'll see on, on the right of the, that um, structure there, kind of a community room. And we know their CEO, um, Mike King, has told us that that was the room that was highly utilized uh, for some opportunity just to get out in that space. They also have a beautiful courtyard in the, the back of that home. Kind of moving now to your right, that's St. John's home in Rochester, New York. I've talked a lot about that. Single family home. So that's another style of greenhouse homes. That's the predominant st style right now. That having been said, and we'll go down to the, the bottom left, that is John Knox Village in Pompano Beach, Florida. And that is a seven story building. You've got 12 greenhouse homes in that structure. Um, you've got a greenhouse home on either bank of the elevator. And once again, those are uh, 12 homes for 12 people. Uh, Jewish Senior Life, 12, excuse me, three homes for 12 people in each home. And the um, St. John's home is 10 private rooms. I think the other thing we get asked all the time, so what's the future design and how many design webinars are out there now thinking about what did we learn from COVID? I hope I've, I've shown you some compelling data that would inform what we do going forward quantifiably based on what we've learned. I'd say the outdoor space and porch is pretty darn important to get elders outside and experiencing some of those things that we know to help build our psychosocial well-being and our physical well-being. Um, having a front door, there's something about that front door that
that really indicates this is an autonomously functioning home. It's a real home. It's a front door. And, you know, we're very careful about who's coming and going. It's not like a traditional nursing home where people are, are really more coming and going. Private rooms with a private three-piece bath, thinking about deliveries, how you get deliveries into the home. The versatility of the space, the small cohorts. Everybody was talking about cohorting. What did we learn in cohorting? It was really limiting the people who were going in and out, almost like a versatile worker and, and those people really taking on more responsibilities. Consistency was important. That's the future for design. And last but not least, I want to leave you with this. The greenhouse model is not simply a small house movement. And there are many out there who would want to focus and perseverate on the design. And it's beautiful and it's significantly important. But these next words are important and I want you to hear them. It's a movement to deinstitutionalize, destigmatize, and humanize care for all people so that they're able to live meaningful and purposeful lives. And I think the deinstitutionalization starts with our mindsets and our beliefs and those deeply held traditions that we've had for so long. It's been a part of our paradigm and it's deinstitutionalizing that. It's really confronting ageism and the stigmas and stereotypes that we have held, the devaluation that has allowed in many respects, you know, our funding and underfunding, I should say, to really allow something like this to happen. But as we go forward, it's time that we acknowledge it, we deinstitutionalize, destigmatize, and we really seek to humanize care so that all individuals are able to live deep, meaningful, purposeful lives. So with that, my friends, uh, that concludes our session. And uh, you can reach me through the greenhouseproject.org or via my email, sbryan at the greenhouseproject.org. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention.